today's live event, we will hear from a team of middle and high school teachers from Holland Hall in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Holland Hall has been working with GOA this past year to foster student-led learning by empowering students to give and receive high quality feedback. In a moment, our panelists will share some of their incredible work products from this year, and they'll invite questions from all of you attending here today. Learning science tells us that students learn deeply when learning experiences are designed in a way in which students have the ability to develop ownership over their own learning. We're so fortunate today to be hearing from a team of educators who've made some significant strides to support deeper student engagement and cognitively complex work by fostering student-led learning. And so I'll start by introducing our panelists. First, we are joined today by Eric Hudson, who is GOA's Director of Learning and Design. He's been the lead on this partnership work with Holland Hall throughout fall 2021. And today he'll be in conversation with the following educators from Holland Hall. Um, and so joining us, we have Jane Beckliffe representing uh, the Social Studies Upper School Faculty, Edder Williams McKnight representing the English Upper School Faculty, Pam Rogers representing Science Middle School Faculty, and Andrea Reese representing English middle school faculty. And so on our agenda, we will begin by hearing a little bit from Eric first about the partnership and then talking to Jane, um, who will introduce Holland Hall, give some background on how this partnership came to be, uh, as well as what some of the high level outcomes are of this work. We'll then hear from Edder, Pam and Andrea, who will share samples of their work products, what they did, why they did it, and the ultimate impact that it had on students and their learning. We'll then kick it back to Eric, who will facilitate some Q&A with the panelists, drawing upon some of the questions that were submitted during registration, as well as any questions that come up during the chat today. And then finally, we'll close with some next steps about how you can continue to learn with us at GOA. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Eric and Jane to get us started. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, really happy to be here. Really happy to be highlighting the work of these four fantastic educators. I work with them and about a dozen more of their colleagues as part of this learning partnership that the GOA Design Lab had with Holland Hall. Um, and just to, I'm going to hand this off to Jane. Jane was kind of the lead on this partnership. She's going to tell you a little bit about its origin um, and a little bit about the work. And then we're going to have Edder, Pam, and Andrea share some of the projects that they worked on as part of the partnership, which fits in a much larger context around learning and assessment and feedback at Holland Hall. So I'm going to ask Jane to dive in and tell us about the partnership. Hey, hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're so excited to, to be here with you. Um, what you see on this slide is a beautiful picture of our 162 acre campus in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Holland Hall is a pre-K through 12 independent school. Um, the way this all started is that um, in January of 2020, Holland Hall faculty were invited to apply for an annual financial award to support innovative teaching at Holland Hall. And the purpose of the Jennifer and Tom Sharp Faculty Development Fund was to provide radically different professional development opportunities for faculty. The ultimate result of the innovative initiative and the work we would do should be to enhance the curriculum and or teaching techniques to boost student experience in conjunction with the school's mission, goals, and strategic plan. So when this was rolled out in its inaugural year, there was a small group of us who had been experimenting with aspects of competency-based learning. And we were, had been having conversations within our community about the school's culture around grades and grading. And so this seemed like a perfect opportunity to generate a proposal to create professional development around the innovative work we were doing in small pockets to have more training, um, evidence-based um, background understanding on what good feedback looks like, how to design with competency-based learning at the foundation. Um, so with those things in mind, I started to put together a proposal and started to ask around um, who would be interested in self-selecting, opting into this um, idea. Um, from there, I realized that, um, well, as I was thinking of this, I had seen GOA do their work with other schools and I thought, how, can, how do we get to do that? 
And I knew that GOA would be a great partner, but I just didn't know how to frame it. So I set up um, a meeting with Eric and he helped define and create the component parts and the structure to make it all doable. Um, and some of the key components for that was how many people, what's the right number for a you know, professional learning community around this work? Um, how do we create professional development that embeds a train the trainer model so that we can continue to do in-house training um, with the expertise that we could then bring to the table for our colleagues? And also, how do we curate the artifacts? How do we scaffold the next steps? How do we articulate our vision for long-term impact and implementation? And he has just been a brilliant partner in, in all of that work. Another thing that we did that was has been instrumental to the success of our work is that we invited um, the administrative team to join us in this as part of the cohort. And we had learning specialists from middle and upper branches. Um, we had the assistant head of academic affairs participate directly and our branch heads in the middle and, and upper schools. And they've been uh, advocates for us. They've been completely um, immersed in the work as well from, from their perspective. And that has been um, amazing. And we're so grateful for their involvement. And so what you can see here on this slide, I have a, like a party going on outside my door. I'm sorry. Um, that's what schools look like here. It's just one big party. Um, so the way it was structured is we started a launch with an in-person meeting with Eric and the cohort in August of this year. This was also postponed a year because of COVID. So we um, just got started in August. And then from, you'll see from September through December, we met in small co smaller breakout groups by discipline um, but across branches. So discipline specific, but multi-branch um, communication, which is something we really struggle with here. So that's been really helpful to have that built in. And over the, each month, we had check-in meetings with Eric to talk about, as you can see here, how he staged that out. Um, and so it kept us accountable, but very low stakes. Like he knows that we were busy and how we would struggle with certain things, but just to meet a, a threshold of what to deliver in those meetings so we could keep um, tracking our progress and feeling like we were having small wins along the way and, and work that was very um, intense. And then um, we came together in January of this year to wrap all that up and to talk about, so what is the vision? And what are our next steps and how do we carry this work forward? I'm really excited for you to hear from my colleagues who are gonna share their work and they'll get into some of the, they'll demonstrate some of the high level outcomes. And Eric, on the next slide, I'll just preview those. So we all witnessed um, increased student fluency with self-reflection. It was a huge uh, win for us. Um, improved student work, better application of teacher feedback, holding students accountable for reading it and then applying it in their work and tracking how it was showing up. Um, deeper engagement with the material that is embedded you know, in course content. And um, of course we had fails and we went into iterative design work. And what was good about, you know, with any failure, it's increasing our learning, but we could pinpoint where the struggle was occurring. So we could look at, is our language not landing? Do we need to be a more collaborative work with our students to get to the language that makes the most sense in our competencies and skills? Um, how am I translating things? Am I being accountable to what I said? You know, we can track all of that work. So that's been really helpful. And with that, I think I'll just turn it over so you can hear more of the tangible um, outcomes and results that um, my colleagues were able to produce. Thanks, Jane. Um, that was a very helpful overview. I appreciate it. The only thing I will add before I pass it to Edder to dive into her work is that this was very much a sort of job embedded process. Um, you know, it is very much about hoping that teachers can locate something specific in the classes they're currently teaching that they can investigate or try. Um, that was a very important part of Jane's thinking about this in terms of making it sustainable for all the cohort members involved. It couldn't feel like 
too, too, too much of an add-on. It certainly was an add-on, but the relevance and the practicality of it um, and the sustainability of it was absolutely a priority for this cohort. So I'm gonna to transition to Edder, uh, who's gonna talk through some of the work she did with her students. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Edder, as you heard, and I'm really excited to see who's in the chat and that we have people from all around the globe joining in this moment. My interest at the beginning of this project was to build a language of learning. So my premise is that if we're going to talk about these things called competencies and skills, which is something I've been working on for some time, um, it really doesn't come alive until students are talking about it as these like key terms and words that I'm trying to get them to learn. If it's not part of their natural language, it's probably not landing as deep as I want it to be. So I wanted this year to just be more overt to use the language of um, these skills and competencies. I wanted to move from competencies as a blueprint behind the curriculum. You know, it's like I've, everything that I've done is designed around these skills that I've identified into competencies being a way that betters the way students and I talk about the learning that they're undergoing, as well as thinking about how do we make sure they're nicely twinned or married or combined with the content that we're trying to teach. Lots of words there. So I'm gonna show you a case study, but before I do that, I'm gonna just, yes, thank you. Um, really emphasize that like I wanted it in their mouths and I was like what's in their mouths like words like observation and ambiguity and revision and reflection and things like that that should be a part of the conversation even as Sunny's Blues or whatever we're reading as literature is a part of the conversation okay thank you so I'm going to show you one student in one class I did this with both of my classes this year but one class is called literature and human nature this is a senior class and I thought it'd be interesting to talk about how did this student ownership of the um, of the curriculum happen through one student he is a fine student you know he's not the like a plus 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 kind of guy but he is a very strong um, worker and he loves to be thorough in terms of getting his work done on time, that kind of thing. But as we'll see here, he really wanted to go deeper into his thinking and process. So how did I do what I did? I started the semester as many of us do with saying, what are your learning goals and what are your personal goals for this semester? And they talked about everything from I got to get into college to, you know, I want to get better at a particular learning skill. And so this student, this is a quote. And yes, I know the E in English is lowercase and he is not working on capitalization, but that's okay. I want it to be really real for you. Um, and so this is what he said. What I'd like to work on this semester is structure. And he referred to a, a course he had the, the year before called American Studies or AMSTUD for short. And he realized that structuring an essay was kind of tough for him. So he wanted to work on structure. And he said, I'd also like to get better at ambiguity. So this is their first time looking at the list of skills. And mind you, I did make a few revisions of the, you know, from August to say end of August. I was like, ah, I better do it this way. So anyway, I just let you know, this is all real and how it went down last semester. And if you click the slide, you'll get to see a list of the skills that I found to be very important for literature and human nature. Now, allow me to tell you that this course is about inquiry, really. And although it sounds very lofty, it's really about how do students unearth the questions that they are living within them about life? What do they really care about? What do they really want to know in the world? And it's very similar to Rilke, who talks about um, in Letters to the Young Poet, like lean into the questions. He's like, don't be so quick to run to the answers, but live the questions now. So my whole course is about them having the tools, engaging literature, engaging philosophers to think about what is the question that matters most to them. So to do this well, I decided there are four major competencies that I want them to focus on. One is question posing. And Eric, I don't know if your cursor is like able to move around a little like question posing. This is interactive, y'all. Okay, um, so the question posing is one big competency and there's a list under there. 
Then there's close reading and close listening, which is um, a new kind of skill I introduced to them. And then there's meaning making, and then there's expression and um, storytelling. So these are the big things. You'll notice that there are a lot of skills underneath them and they don't get all of these skills at one time. Like I show them the master rubric and then we kind of scaffold the skills according to the assignment that they are doing. But by the end of the semester, this is the big bad mamma jamma that everything has been designed around. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So the student saw you know, a version of that list and he said, yeah, this is, this is what I want to work on, ambiguity structure. And then, you know, we're reading all Sonny's Blues, we're talking about Sartre, we're talking about, you know, all these things. And then around October, we did a self-assessment. And this was a really great moment. Um, Eric and Andrea and another colleague and I had been talking along the way, and he was very good at nudging us to just have easy wins, but also like reflective moments where students can get closer to the goals that we are trying to, to achieve. Um, so one of the things I did was a self-assessment. And again, I know most of you on this chat do all this stuff. It's just being more intentional about how you're pivoting it or how you're focusing in on it. So these are two pieces from the, um, the self-assessment that I'm showing you. I asked him to take two or three of the competencies um, and talk about and sort of mark themselves. Where do they think they are? Are they doing really, really well with them? Do they feel like they are mastering it, et cetera? Um, and he said, my student that I'm showing you, we'll call him Damien. He said, you know, with critical thinking and grappling with ambiguity, ah, I'm all right. I'm working on it. You know, I don't feel like I've really, really gotten there, but I, I do see I'm making progress. And then later I said, look, maybe that's not what you really want to work on. Decide the two competencies that for the rest of the semester, this is your focus. This is really what you want to see yourself improve in. And interestingly, he chose, me, chose meaning making and expression and storytelling. So I was like, that's really interesting. And that can help me pivot my feedback to you closer to what you really care about. So this is again, gaining student ownership. Okay, let's see what's on the next slide. So we move along, we move along, we move along. And you know, there's feedback, there's assignments, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end, there was another sort of, uh, let's say artifact for us to look at. And I decided to show you that for the final project, which was in December, I asked students to do, what, do the project, but before they turned that in, they had to also do what's called an author's page. And these are three of the things I pulled from the author's page for, to share with you. And one was like, what works well? And so he talked about, I thought my responses to the questions were detailed and gave a complete and full answer. Now I'm gonna tell you why that is significant to me because part of the reason why I think that student wanted to work on ambiguity and knew he wasn't really strong at it yet is because there are some skills he wasn't really practicing. And if I didn't know he cared about it, I probably would have missed it. He needed to work on getting more detailed about the kinds of questions he asked, playing, grappling with, with um, things he doesn't understand more instead of just kind of getting one answer. Like, how do I really struggle through something that is confusing? And then also generating multiple questions for something instead of like slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, did my assignment done. So like the fact that he was focusing in on how he treated his question, I was like, huh, that's really great. Um, and then at the bottom, he kind of reflected on the competency or skill that he was working most on. And I was like, wow, he's talking about questions again. And so he said, this really forced me to work on grappling. And when I saw the word grappling, I was like, I want to do a cartwheel. Because I was like, yes, he is really trying to go into deeper learning and deeper knowledge. Um, and he said, I feel like I really asked some good grappling questions that help me better understand the question I am living. Um, so in his project and as he reflects on it, he is using the language. But I think that what I really cared about is he figured out how to get closer to what he really wanted as a learner. 
he wanted to be a deeper reader and thinker. And he realized that the way to get there was through questions. And if I hadn't asked him some of these preliminary things, I would have missed it, I think. I, I would have been focused on something else or just congratulating him on how great he is at turning his assignments in on time or something like that. So I'm going to pause there and we can ask more, talk about more things later in the Q&A. But that's what I wanted to share with you for this one. Thank you, Edder, so much. Um, something that I really appreciated that Edder said that I wanted in their mouths thing, like at the very beginning of the partnership, and it became kind of a mantra to me when I was talking to everyone else in this cohort. Something that you did beautifully was you phrased your competencies and outcomes in a way that uh, the language was very accessible to students. You made it easier for them to put it in their mouths, I guess is the best <laughs> way to put it. And so um, I really, that made, I think some of the successes you saw really helpful. And I think that's a really important takeaway for some folks on the call who might be interested in framing learning outcomes this way is ultimately students have to be able to understand them and internalize their meaning. And you did a lovely job um, phrasing that. And I hope there's some questions too when we get to the Q&A. But we're gonna transition um, to Pam uh, and to talk through some of the work she did with her middle school science students. Pam, you ready to go? Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. So my name is Pam Rogers and I teach sixth grade science at Holland Hall Middle School. Um, and this was just an amazing opportunity to really play with things that I had been working with. And it gave me an excuse to really dive deeply and to frame it in a way that I could work with in my classes. So I was really grateful for this opportunity. So I'm calling my sort of talk, um, the power of one and how competency can skates can build metacognition and student led success, one mind and one goal at a time. And so I just kind of want to build context around kind of what our program looks like and why this fit in so well. Um, our middle school is actually structured great four through eight and grade six is actually sort of the pivot point it's where we sort of move from being in that lower middle school sort of area on up into the, our upper level middle school so so we've been talking a lot about what is the main purpose of being in sixth grade and what is it that we really want our kids to come away with and of course we all love our content and we value that deeply but we really have always felt even more and more all the time that what we really need to emphasize are habits of the mind, um, ways of asking questions, um, ways that we can give them skills that are gonna build um, success, both academically as they move forward through our program here at Holland Hall and actually life skills. So um, in the sixth grade, we work with learning how to learn. We learn a bunch about the brain and the neuroscience of learning. Um, and we also work a lot with metacognition. So this was this kind of gave me the ability to start to really think about deeply, how can I bring this to my students in a meaningful way that they will understand and that they'll actually have a lot of control and power with. So, okay, Eric, we can move forward. Thank you. So I think that we would probably all agree that um, middle school is kind of this liminal place, right? It's kind of not childhood anymore and it's really not upper school. So it's a time when we're trying to figure out who we are and what we're good at. What do I need to grow? And what skills and habits do I need to have that will support my future self? Now, I've always been kind of a believer in less is more. And so I really wanted to experiment with just really focusing on one skill over a long period of time that they could actually work with. with. So, um, okay, we're good. You wanna go forward, Eric? Thank you. Okay, so I um, took a lot of the skills that we've identified. I know they're often called soft skills, which I think is a little bit of a misnomer because these are such important skills. Um, so these are the skills that I sort of scaffolded. Let me kind of give you a background. I work with kids on three different threads throughout the year in my class. Um, and one of them is highly student-centered. It's a genius hour project. They get to study absolutely anything they want. It's how I come in the back door with research skills that are so important in science. Um, so I thought that this was a natural place to sort of embed something like this. So I went ahead and just identified things that we talk about a lot in class anyway, and um, had them read over this. And I tried to put them into words that the kids would tr truly understand. 
Um, so if you want to look on the document on the left, um, this is how I introduced it. Um, and I told them that, you know, I was going to have them choose three skills that I thought perhaps they knew that they needed to do some work in that were that they struggled with. Um, and so we had resourcefulness, time management, tenacity, organization, creativity, curiosity, goal setting, resilience, self-reflection. And you can't see it at the bottom there, but metacognition. And then I just gave them time to think about this. And I said, you know, where, what skills, if they've got just even just a little bit better, do you think would make your life easier, right? Would help you every day and everything that you do. Um, and so this is Anna's work right here. And Anna identified three areas where she felt like she really needed some help. And maybe life would be a little bit easier. Her studies would be easier. Everything would be better if she was a little bit better at self-reflecting, re reflecting, excuse me, if she had just a bit more tenacity and if she could learn to set goals. And I asked them to do a fair amount of self-reflecting. And they also had to give me some examples of why they needed help with this. And then after they identified all three of these areas, we had one-on-one -on -one conferences and we discussed all of these. And I asked them to just choose the one thing that they really wanted to work on for the remainder of the sem semester that they thought would really improve their experience, both as a student and really just sort of moving through in life. And Anna thought that she needed some help with goal setting. So um, she came up with some early ideas of things that would help her too, which I thought was adorable. One of the things that I wanna mention um, and I've thought about this a lot. I think if I introduced something like this at the beginning of the year, I don't think it would have worked. Um, I waited until, well, first of all, because I was part of this group, um, kind of came into it a little bit later. But even moving forward, I think it's really important to do work like this once you have developed a really close relationship with your students. Um, the students trust me and I trust them. They know me well, and we have a really warm relationship one-on-one. -on -one. And so they were so open and they were so honest. Um, and it was really quite touching that they, um, they would just become almost sometimes emotional, like, you'll really help me with this? I can get better at this? This, right. And so it was really quite sweet. And I don't think I would have had that outcome if I had started the year doing this. So, okay, Eric, can I move it forward? Thank you. And so um, I came up with a system where they would track their goals. The goal would always say the same thing. They would set little tiny baby steps as to how they would move forward. Little things like I will clean my locker or I will remember to do this, depending upon what their goal was. And then it, they had an I can statement. So if they were able, if they were moving a little bit forward, they could move. I can do this now, right? So that was a positive affirmation for them. <clears throat> Excuse me, students in the hall. Um, anyway, so I also want to point out that this needs to be a long process, right? I think that the science of habit formation and the science um, is it's pretty firm out there now and it doesn't happen instantly it happens over time and it's it's incremental it happens in little tiny shifts right so this is kind of what i was trying to set up for the students so that they could experience little successes on the way and they could be empowered to change so so she was able to do use her learning from what we've learned in neuroscience and science um, to and she knows that everything changes the brain that practice strengthens neural networks and that the stronger your neural networks are, the easier things to become. That practicing goal setting over time would make her a better goal setter. And she's empowered to know that she can change any behavior that she wishes. It just takes goal setting and studied practice. Now I will also notice, if you will notice, they actually graded themselves and this grade actually went into the grade book. So this was actually part of their overall grade for the term. So this also was very empowering for them. I'm gonna go ahead and move it forward, Eric, thank you. Okay, so just kind of to sum it up, um, she was able to reflect on her strengths and her weaknesses. Um, she self-identified one skill that she knows would help her now and in the future. She came up with a carefully calibrated plan to make small changes over time. And she's evolved in self-assessing. She has evolved in her process of, of looking to see how well she's done. And I think that this is just a really powerful lesson that you know students can identify what they need help with, that they can actually make changes over time. Um, and I'm 
just a hundred percent believer now in just identifying one thing. I'm really excited about this because I really feel like there's such power. There's that cas cascading competencies and being able to identify something and seeing that it will actually improve so many areas of their life. And so I think there's a lot of power in that. So that's it. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate your focus on one as well. I love how grounded you are in the science of habit formation. And so intentionality and focus on a single skill over time will actually build maybe some habits that they'll be able to apply to new skills and more skills as they move through. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Eric. Um, so we're going to close with Andrea before Q&A. She's going to talk about working with fifth graders. Thank you all so much for having me here. It's a delight, honor to be part of this. Um, I feel like I work with some amazing colleagues that have taught me a lot along the way. Um, and as we got together and talked about feedback here at Holland Hall, I was really struck by um, the idea of having students help to create a rubric so that they can be better self-assessors. And so I thought to myself, what can I do that is tangible in one school year um, that's not going to be too overwhelming? Um, because after our conversations, I just thought, oh, I'm going to revamp my whole curriculum. This is going to be wonderful. Well, we can't do that in one school year. And I have to be patient with myself. I'm not always patient. So I decided that I wanted to focus on the area of writing. I teach both reading and writing to fifth graders. Um, reading, I feel like we're doing a really great job in a lot of ways. In the writing, I really felt like my students were not good at reflecting on their own work. And I often found myself, you know, giving a reflection or giving a rubric, and I was writing all the feedback for them because every time I tried to have them do a self-reflection, it was oh, it's good, it's fine, I did great, I liked it. Um, it wasn't really diving deep into their performance. And so um, I decided to take one small project, writing a summary at the beginning of the year. We're learning how to structure a summary, write a paragraph, and I would throw them this rubric with a huge high stakes grade, They've never been graded in writing before. And um, it would say all the line items with an attached um, value next to it. And it was worth 42 points. We would go over it together. I really thought they understood it. And I would spend hours grading these summaries. And then I would write down so much feedback and I really didn't feel like they were absorb absorbing it at all because when they went to go write a new summary, a lot of the same consistent problems continued to happen over and over and over again. So as we got together, our colleagues, um, I was really struck by an article that I read about de co-designing rubrics with students. Um, so I started, I thought, how am I gonna do this? Where do I even start? Because I didn't wanna take the grade rubric that I was throwing at them for all of these years. I thought, okay, I'm gonna create a rubric that I think would work well that doesn't have a grade attached to it and would seem to make sense for fifth graders. So Eric, if you could move ahead. I wanted to give them time to process their performance by looking at this rubric. Go ahead and move over one more slide. <laughs> okay, so this is the rubric I came up with. And these are words that I have been using for you know 16 years. Um, needs improvements, meets expectations and exceeds expectations. And so what I did was for, I have four sections. So I put this up on the board and I showed this to the student. This was my revamped summary reflection that was gonna be super reflective and amazing. Just really focusing on the skills that we've discussed as a class, trying to use layman's terms, all of the things. So I put this up and immediately I, I asked students, can you, what do you guys think about this rubric? You can tear it apart. I don't care. Tell me what, what you like and what you don't like. There were a few compliments. Oh, I really like, there's not a grade that, you know, I can breathe again. And I thought, okay, this is a good start. But then um, I had a lot of hands go into the air that as they were looking at this, they're like, so what is exceeds expectations? And I said, you know, it's, 
you know, it's really good. It's, it's like, it's better than what it, what it needs to be. But what does that mean, Mrs. Reese? What does exceeds expectation means? And I just, I really did not have a strong answer for them. And I said, okay, well, I agree with you. Maybe there is not a great meaning behind exceeds expectations. What should we do? They're like, can we just take that column out? So we did. And uh, unanimously, without me coaching any of the classes, all four of them, I would say 98% of them wanted that column gone. They just simply wanted to know, did I do it or did I not do it? So we went ahead and removed it. They did some wording changes as well. Each class's rubric came out slightly different but really met all of the same ultimate goals that we were looking for. And I thought the students were really thoughtful about it. Um, and I, 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 at first, wasn't quite sure how this was gonna roll out and play out. Um, Eric, if you wanna show the next slide, this was our redesigned rubric. Um, we had some um, really funny conversations in the class. Most of them were fine with just meets expectations, needs work. I usually had one or two students in each of the classes. They're like my, I want 100% all the time. Can you just maybe put a star in meets expectations if you think I did a really good job? Sure, I'm happy to do that for you. Um, and then they also felt like needs improvement really was too harsh. Like it, it sort of was like, I'm a failure. And so they said, if I, if you put on there, like look over again or need some work, I feel like, okay, I can go back and I can look at that again. It feels like I have this open ability to go back and revise my work. So this is one example of a rubric that we created together. Eric, if you want to. Okay. So we use this in a variety of ways. I decided that I wanted to give them an opportunity not only to use this for themselves, but also to have the opportunity to do more peer evaluation in the classroom. Because, you know, lo and behold, what we see in our own writing, somebody else use it differently as they read it. We've talked about that a lot in class. Um, and so we started basics, small. Um, and at first, I wasn't quite sure. I was like, you know, I. I don't know if this is making progress, but I'm going to stick to this because I was kind of learning along the way that I think the biggest problem, the reason why my kids can't reflect as well as I'd like them to is because they haven't had the practice. And um, I wasn't quite sure if it was helpful yet in the beginning, um, but I stuck to this. So I did this for summaries. You can see we did a self-evaluation and a teacher evaluation. We also, and it, it was the same every time. So what they viewed themselves, the peers assessed them exactly the same rubric. And then I used the same rubric to grade them. I've now done this for every single writing project in my classroom. So if you wanna switch to the next slide. So we did a personal narrative. This was kind of one of our first bigger writing um, assignments. And this is all done at school. We use Writer's Workshop. It's all about the process. Um, and I, I am realizing that I wasn't really using Writer's Workshop to its full capacity by leaving a lot of peer and self-evaluation out. So this has been really fun for me to add it back in. Again, I did a self-evaluation, a peer evaluation, and then I used their self-evaluation to make comments on. So it was consistent across the board. All the students knew exactly what was on there. And then every line item that you see were mini lessons that were directly taught to them along the way. So as I went through each lesson, I added a line item onto the rubric, depending on when the lesson was taught. And so by the end, they could share um, with each other what they saw, and then also think about their own writing. Um, and I found that, you know, with all of the pieces, students were surprised in multiple ways. I had students that were surprised how well other people in their class were writing because they viewed themselves as the best writer ever, but they got paired with somebody else who was actually a really good writer as well. And it surprised them. They thought, I might not be the number one student in the grade. There is somebody else that can write really well with me. Um, but I also, on the flip side, have students who are very weak writers who thought they did really well on everything. And when their peer 
evaluated it. They weren't super harsh about it, but the peer would probably, you know, check mark. There's not a lot of detail, but when they read the other person's work, they soon realized themselves, oh, you know, my story is like five sentences and they have like, you know, a page and a half with dialogue and all of these things. And they soon realized I've got to go back and do, do more work, do more work. So that's been really fun to watch. And I still wasn't quite sure the progress made, but I think it was going in the right direction at this point. If you want to switch to the next slide. Okay, so we are right now finishing up our first essay. They're doing a persuasive essay nominating a family member for person of the year, really focusing on structure and the five paragraphs. And I did the same thing. We do our mini lessons. They then did a self-evaluation based on each of the mini lessons. And you can see here that instead of check marks now, we've evolved into actually giving written feedback to themselves within it. Um, it's not the neatest thing in the world, but I was really pleased to see the change of actually thinking through, okay, I think I really did this well. I really loved um, in the part where we were talking about engaging leads, we used this cute little, little red writing hooks as an example. We took the once upon a time and this was in our personal narrative. So it was in the previous writing unit. He's referring back to the lesson from the previous writing unit saying, I need to go back and add a better engaging lead. So I really liked that aspect. And then also thinking about restating the main ideas. He really realized that maybe he needed to go back and look through that aspect of his paragraph writing. Um, and then what I really loved, if you can switch to the next slide, that was a self-evaluation. This was the peer evaluating this, the student's work. I loved the feedback that he gave. I loved that he said, I can tell how much you love and appreciate your aunt. And it was a very good essay. But then very politely, you might wanna consider putting a little more detail in some areas. So instead of having smiley faces and it was good, I'm now actually getting real-time feedback that is more valuable. And for the first time, as I've been now working through conferencing with the students on these essays, it's probably the best set of essays I've had ever in terms of them taking more ownership over their work. So all that to be said, I was really kind of skeptical about the amount of time I was putting into this in the classroom and that it was putting me behind. Um, but I am now recognizing the fact that now that we've practiced more and more, we're actually speeding up the process when we're giving feedback because they've actually held themselves more accountable for the, the different aspects that we're trying to incorporate into writing. So I've really enjoyed seeing the, the transformation. Um, I've had to be patient along the way, but now I feel the benefits and it's, it's really exciting to me. I'm excited to do more. We're about to get ready to do um, research writing and a whole, the whole research project um, going through all the steps of the process. And so I'm gonna use a lot of this technique through that to see if I can do like a portfolio-based um, reflective research process with them. So you can flip to the next slide. Okay, so I just, I really do feel like this has made them more accountable for their own learning and have enjoyed watching that process in them. And that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andrea. That was great. And I will say that Andrea's fifth graders uh, in eliminating exceeds expectations are in tune with grading researcher Thomas Gusky, who recommends the exact same thing. So fifth graders and Gusky have a lot in <laughs> common. Um, so let's transition to um, just some Q&A. And Andrea, you have a question for specifically to yours in the chat. So if you want to tackle that one in the chat, that would be great. Um, if the rest of you have questions that you want for the group in the few minutes we have left, please do submit them in the chat. Um, for Jane and Edder and Pam, a question that came up in the pre-submitted questions a lot was the idea of quick wins. What is something a teacher who wants to try stuff like what you've tried can do um, that they could implement tomorrow or next week that would help them sort of see some progress, test the waters, 
get a sense of how they want to move forward. And any of you can jump in and, and share your thoughts. Sorry, sorry. Um, if you are familiar with single point rubrics, I think just rolling out a quick, simple pick something, put it in a format that's very digestible. GOA has posted things on single point rubrics before. That was a great starting point for me personally. Thank you, Edder, Pam. Yeah, I just add on what does the student really want to learn and think they're learning and just knowing that inside world of their mind is really helpful in making choices about your direction as well. Yeah, sometimes just asking those open ended questions right and listening to the answers can be really helpful. Like, What do you want to learn? What are you thinking? Yeah. You're learning? What do you yeah. want to do? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I would dovetail on that too. And I think just even just small goal setting right? Just having a student just set a goal. It, maybe it's just for a class or maybe it's for the week and then having them circle back and check in and see how they did, right? So that they're still taking ownership of that, ownership of that, right? But they can also, you can also see progress though. I mean, it'll be obvious if, if they're accomplishing what their goal is, they should be moving forward. That's great. Um, Pam, a question came for you, but I guess I would ask, pose this to the others too. Can you talk about some of the ways you create psychological safety around some of these things with students? Um, I can, I assume that some of the stuff can be kind of vulnerable making for students. So you alluded to this a little bit in your presentation, but I'll start with Pam and any other thoughts I welcome from the other panelists. Sure. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's all about relationships, really. Um, I just start from day one, and I know we all do this, right? We know our students well. Um, we smile a lot. Little things like that, right? The little little things that we do to make them feel comfortable. And I'm also very vulnerable. I tell them I'm dyslexic, all right, and I just put it out there, right? So, and I also model when I make mistakes, and so that it's a really safe place in my classroom to make mistakes and to not be perfect. And we talk about that a lot. And so I think after we've had those conversations um, and I've just, I, I go out of my way to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with each kid a lot. We used to have an old saying at a school that I was at every child every day, right? Just, just even a quick conversation. I know them well. At the beginning of the year, they've written me a letter that's told me a whole bunch of cool stuff about them. So I can just refer back to that and ask them those questions. So after it's really just about the relationship building, I think. Jane, Edder, Andrea, anything to add to that? I, I agree. Say that. Oh. <laughs> Edder, you first. <laughs> You're muted. There we go. The click thing click. Um, I think actually sometimes building safety is also something you do incrementally over time. Um, teaching older students who are really concerned about high stakes things like grades and how that's going to impact them for their rest of their lives, you know, and that feeling of immensity, even if we have different perspective, it takes time because sometimes they, they see rubric, they are wondering, you know, the grade and you have to kind of work through that um, and help them to really roll back to like, the skills will lead you to the grades. The skills will lead you to the grades. Do you trust this feedback? Like, what does it make? How does it? And you just do all these different things of peer feedback to like restating things. You, it's It really does take time sometimes. And I don't want to um, minimize what it means to create safety for them. It takes a while for them to feel a trust in the process I, I have found. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, oh, sorry, Andrea, I'll come in after you. Okay. I've also found that even um, at this point of the year, um, for some students to hold writing conferences with teachers is really scary. And um, many of them love it and they come back for more. I mean, they, they could go through 10 conferences and they're great. But for some of them, they will hide and hide and hide until I call them to my back table. And it really is about creating that safety net. Hey, you know, Johnny, um, everybody is going to get, you know, feedback on this. This is a safe place to improve your writing. You're not going to be graded on this. Um, this is about having a conversation about writing and improving it. Um, you're not the only one that has mistakes. Every single person in this class has had mistakes. The only reason we may have some more mistakes right now is because somebody else may have conferenced five times and you haven't conferenced with me yet. 
Um, and you can immediately just see them take a breath. Okay. Um, so that safety net is absolutely crucial, building that safe place for them to feel comfortable with feedback. Yeah, I think that related to all of that, when Eric helped us really understand evidence-based high quality feedback, what that includes, what it is and what it isn't. And that I think what creates so much anxiety for our students is the skills are not clearly articulated. The way they're being graded is not clear. They feel like it's a moving target. And if, if you show them that you are accountable to what you said you were going to do and that your language meets the criteria of high quality feedback and that you are consistent in that, they start to build the trust through the feedback that you're giving. And then they, and then they, when they are in self-reflection mode with you, you start to enter into dialogue about their learning and it becomes about the learning and not so much about the grade, but that is also a process of low stakes and, and revision loops that then lead to the higher stakes summative assessment so that they feel that they've taken enough intellectual risk and been giving enough feedback along the way to understand that they're on a path of improvement, continuous improvement. And so that's about classroom culture and the systems you create. Thank you. Um, I know we have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen so Sierra can bring it to a close, but Jane, a question came in that felt like a really good close to this, which is what's next for your team? Um, you've done all this work in this cohort. What are you thinking about in terms of expanding the work? And pardon me while I share screen to get ready for the end. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so Mila, I saw your question. Thank you for that. Um, I think um, a big win for us right out of the gate was getting admin on board and the investment they've made in this because they are um, meeting and designing out those next steps based on our work. Um, we are also doing work at our school with NeuroTeach and with diversity, equity, and belonging. And we are also connecting the dots between feedback and competency-based learning, diversity, equity, and belonging, and NeuroTeach. Um, so we have a lot happening that's coalescing around our work and our work is a component part. Um, and we don't know exactly what the next steps are, but we, it is clear that our work is not done and that it will um, have a larger impact and that those of us who have been through this work uh, with Eric and this partnership will help lead the next phases in some way and be available to our colleagues, which to create the cohort, we had to turn people away who wanted to do this work, who've just been meeting with various of us along the way saying, tell me what you're working on. I've been doing this thing. What do you think? And we've just been entering into these very authentic conversations across branches and, and, with, and between disciplines. So I'm very hopeful. I'm sorry, I don't have any concrete answers, but um, check back in with us in a couple months and I bet we'll have some cool stuff to share. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I really would emphasize exactly what Jane said around all your different initiatives. Can you find the intersection points around sort of the student learning experience and really drill into those things? I love that Venn diagram that Jane described. That's super important.